is going on everybody my name is Michael Levan and thank you so much for joining us on part two of the service mesh and ingress series for Kubernetes. Now in this video what we're going to do is we're going to actually dive into the ingress and kind of get started with it and take a look and see how it works. So we're going to see a few different options on how we can install an ingress. We're going to see a few different types of ingress controllers and we're going to talk a little bit about ingress and why we ultimately want to use it. Now if you didn't check out the last episode, the last episode goes over the overall architecture of ingress and the way that ingress works. This video is going to be more about okay now we know how it works. Let's look at how we can start implementing it. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right into the video. All right, now before we dive into the hands-on goodness, we of course need to go over a little bit of the theory. If you've seen any of my other series on the Packet Pushers YouTube channel, you would know that I do theory in the beginning and then we get onto the hands-on goodness. I promise it's not gonna be super crazy or super long. However, I believe that this is very, very crucial for your ingress journey. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, first things first, why ingress? So we kind of talked about this a little bit already in the architecture video, but when you have, let's say five applications and they have five different services, you're limited because you have to use each service for each application. Whereas with an ingress, you can have one ingress controller pointing to multiple services versus having five load balancers for five services, you got one load balancer for five services. Now when it comes from a cost perspective, load balancers in the cloud are not free, nor are they cheap. <laughs> so you need to have some type of ingress from a cost perspective. And then the next is, it is layer seven focus. So from an OSI model perspective, the application layer, that's really where ingress kind of sits right up there, which is again why people genuinely like services and Kubernetes and ingress in general because it sits right up top on the layer seven. That's really all you have to worry about from this perspective. It handles the rest for you. Now, as we all know, in Kubernetes, everything is done via an API. So you have custom resource definitions, you have controllers, all of that kind of encompasses the API that's built for you to be able to use inside of Kubernetes. Now, in this case, it is API version networking.k8s.io slash v1. So this is out of alpha and it is out of beta and there is an official v1 release of this Kubernetes API. And the kind is ingress. And as you can see a little bit here, again, we're gonna dive into this throughout this course. However, you got a little glimpse here of what it ultimately looks like. So you have the ingress class name, right? You have the host, so if you're running it on local host or if you're running it on whatever Kubernetes cluster, you have the path that you want to be able to reach that application at. So if you just have, you know, the forward slash, that means right at the, the landing page, essentially, right at that root web page. And then importantly, you have the service that it's pointing to. So as you can see there, under service name, Nginx service, that's the service that this ingress controller is pointing to. And again, as you're going to see, throughout this course, you can have multiple setups like these. So you can have multiple services that are being used by the same ingress controller. Now, you have two primary ingress traffic patterns. You have the HTTP proxy, which is a custom resource definition in itself, and then you have HTTP proxy with TLS. Now, what does this actually mean? What are the benefits here? Well. First, if you're talking about from a multi-tenancy perspective, HTTP proxy allows you to manage that a little bit easier for a multi-team Kubernetes cluster. So again, if you have, you know, if you're working on multi-tenancy and by multi-tenancy, in this case, I mean users. If you have a bunch of users or a bunch of engineers, whatever you want to call it, working on the same Kubernetes cluster, you can actually segregate the traffic via namespaces, which is really great. You can set up routing configurations to different HTTP proxies, depending on how many ingress controllers you have running. Again, as we talked about, you can have multiple services connecting to the same ingress controller, the same route, which is awesome. Saves you the money of spinning up a bunch of cloud load balancers and saves you the time of managing all of them. Now, when it comes to annotations, which are essentially extensions to your Kubernetes pod. You don't have to worry about setting up those annotations for you. The HTTP, the HTTP proxy does it for you. And there's some validation definitions in there as well. 
Now, one thing that I do want to bring up, I think it's super crucial. Well, I think all of this is super crucial, but something that you should really think about is where you want to run your ingress controller. So there are essentially two methods. You can either run ingress right on the Kubernetes cluster where all of you know the pods are running and the applications and the services and all of that, which is fine. Or you can think about running it at the edge. Now, when I say the edge, I feel like this is super buzzwordy, but the edge ingress really means that you have your ingress controller installed on a separate node. So let's say you have three Kubernetes worker nodes and you have two of that. Well, actually, let's say four because we want to talk about scalability and, and high availability. Let's say you have two worker nodes, Kubernetes worker nodes, that are running your applications and your services. And then you have two worker nodes that are running just ingress controllers. That's all they're doing. They're not doing anything else. They're not hosting any applications or anything like that. They're just running the ingress controllers. That would be considered edge because you're segregating those resources. And then what it's happening is it's going into the worker nodes, right? Well, what I mean is the user, when it hits the ingress controller, when the person hits the ingress controller, they're hitting that ingress controller that's running on those worker nodes. And then that traffic is going to the other worker nodes that are running the applications. So from an architecture perspective and from a heavy load perspective, I do like to segregate where certain things are running in my Kubernetes cluster, ingress being one of them, but it's all an architecture and design decision at the end of the day. All right, so now let's talk about choosing an ingress controller. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna hop over to the web browser. All right, so if you take a look at the Kubernetes documentation, you go to the ingress controllers, you're gonna see a bunch of ingress controllers. One thing that I do want to point out here because this is something that I just recently went through is the Ambassador API Gateway. It does not work with Kubernetes API version 1.22 and above. For that, you will need to use something called, I believe it's pronounced Emissari, E-M-A-S-S-A-R-A, A-R-I. <laughs> Hopefully I got that right. That's the newer version, so to speak. So this should probably be updated at some point. Maybe I'll create a PR to do that. <laughs> However, let's go ahead and take a look at three of the primary ones that I typically use. Now the first and arguably what we're gonna be using throughout this course is the Nginx Ingress Controller. It's probably the most widely used, to be honest with you. It's the, almost like the default, so to speak. However, from an architecture standpoint, from a usability perspective, they all kind of do the same thing anyways with little features here and there, but it's all the same stuff at the end of the day. However, I do want to also point out Istio. Istio has an ingress controller and Kong Mesh. Now, the reason why I want to point these two out is because they have both an ingress controller and a service mesh. So again, going back to that first video when we were saying some engineers say if you have a service mesh, you don't need an ingress controller. That is sometimes true depending on the service mesh that you're using. Now in this case with like Istio, for example, or Kong, when you deploy the service mesh, you're also deploying an ingress controller. Or you can just deploy the ingress controller by itself if you don't want to use the service mesh. However, if you want something that's a combination of both, so you're not using two different tools, or platforms, whatever you want to call it, it may be beneficial to look at Istio or Kong or one of the other service meshes that also have the ingress controller, okay? But if you're like, hey, listen, I'm not going to use an ingress controller for X amount of years or it's not even on the horizon or whatever the case may be and you just want an ingress controller by itself, I always recommend the Nginx ingress controller. So with that, that's going to go ahead and wrap up our video here. And in the next video, we're going to talk about service mesh. And then after that, we're going to get into the hands-on goodness of both the ingress controller and the service mesh. Thank you so much for watching.